We're going to talk about information sources for humanitarian engineering. In particular, we're going to talk about a number of different sources, a uh, whole range of things, everything from humanitarian engineering, the process, to humanitarian technology, to appropriate technology, a special case of humanitarian technology, um, to education things, conferences, journals, workshops, websites, all kinds of stuff, okay? So, um, I, in terms of how to do this, I want to start first with how to approach all the information. Some people, the, the modern term for how you cope with lots of information sometimes is crowdsourcing. When it's when you're trying to find a source of information from a big group of people. Um, so there's a humanitarian engineering community. Those are, oh my goodness, there's all kinds of engineers that are practicing industry that do this on the side. Uh, there's faculty, there's staff, there's students, all over the world. So it's a, it's a sizable group, nobody knows how big. But one of the key points here is, let's say you're out in the field, you come across a challenge, and you know it's a technological challenge, and you think, uh, I got an idea for how to solve this. Really what you should do, the first thing is Google. <laughs> okay, and, and find out if anybody else has already done it, and been doing it for 10 years, and have the solution perfected, okay? Um, I, I have a very hard time anymore having an idea and, and, and finding out that it's actually new. Um, if you do the right searches at Google, you, you're going to find something that's related to it, almost always, okay, if not the same thing. Um, I'm not saying there, there are new things, but not as often anymore, because now we have this easy access to finding out what has been done. Um, so these ideas are often shared via the internet, not always. You have to admit that that's a, a limited source, especially with respect to older information. Information older than, you know, about 20 years ago, a lot of it is not on the web. And you know, probably never will be. So that information, in a sense, is going to be lost, which is a shame. Okay. You know, there was this thing back then called paper. Okay. And it was used a lot. Okay. Maybe we shouldn't use paper anymore, but still need to respect the past. Um, so how do you find that? You could consider print. Go to the library, a place like OSU Library is fantastic, um, and uh, try to find things. Um, but this, is, this finding this information, learning it, and everything, really um, is a key idea, piece of professionalism. A professional at least knows enough to know that they don't know something, and they know how to go find it, right? And so you ought to be able to know enough to go find it. And we're going to talk about strategies uh, for that today. And one of them, we have to talk about the issue in strategy is how to cope with information explosion. You know, uh, I forget the date on it, but I think very few people go past, when you Google something, very few people go past the first page. Okay? Uh, it trails off really fast how deep you go. And it's tough. And I can tell you that Google, I mean, I use Google you know, multiple times every day. But what's fascinating about Google is you can be thinking, searching, 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 and tweaking the words. And if you don't, if you miss the right word, forget it. You miss a whole body of knowledge. We've had that problem with my grad students in the past, where we thought, oh, we've got everything. We're using Google, or whatever. And then you change one term, something a little unexpected, way said. And boom, you open up a whole new body of literature. Wow. So you, get it, you do have to be careful. You got to admit that how hard it is to know that you found the right information, the good information. So the only way to cope with information explosion is, um, in the end, to uh, try to focus on authoritative sources. OK, now, this is difficult to assess. You want authoritative websites, for instance, OK? Um, and the question is, how do you assess it? Well, let's say you're looking for information on the environment, you know, and you pop up the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. It's probably a pretty good source, pretty respectable. What's posted there is probably scientific, etc. Good source. Let's say a journal pops up. Well, uh, we'll talk about that case in a minute. But the online case, okay, 
is complicated because you can get groups. Let's say you're an environmental Nazi, okay? All you care about is the environment. You might, oh, you might not be using science to make your arguments. Your arguments might be true, but you're not using science to make your arguments. And so it's really questionable. And that's not the kind of stuff you should be referencing for humanitarian engineering and using. You should be using quantitative, analytical, justifiable sort of material, okay? Um, I think that's really um, um, very important. You know, some of my kids in the past, you know, they, you talk to them and you're like, look at them and say, wait a minute, you do understand that everything on the internet is not true? But, you know, it's, it's sort of, it, it's people's attitudes are, are, are sort of shocking in this respect sometimes. Well, it's on the internet, it's gotta be true. And you know that's not true, okay? You know that inherently. Now, conferences, um, there's a couple of conferences on humanitarian engineering. There's one called the Global Humanitarian Technology Conference. that's run by a couple organizations, including the IEEE. Um, this is a good conference. I mean, when uh, papers are submitted to it, um, they're reviewed by people in the area. Uh, usually at least two reviewers, sometimes three. I've been reviewing for them for a couple of years, you know, so they, I'll get a couple of papers to review and I'll tell them, come back and say, this is crap or this is really great or whatever, okay? And so those papers have been checked to some extent. So you can trust papers that appear there a lot more. You can go to the conference and listen to people, talk to people, okay? Now journals are a level above a conference in terms of I mean, it's an archival journal publication. Um, usually you're having three to four reviewers. Uh, it's a tougher acceptance. In other words, they'll, they'll just be, they'll beat up the paper typically. Now, the problem is there's variability on conferences. Some conferences take everything that's submitted in order to make money on you. There are journals that seem to take almost anything because the company that owns the journal is trying to make money by publishing lots of papers, okay? But sort of in the community, everybody sort of knows this isn't happening at this journal. This is a good, solid journal. You read several papers from a journal and you're like, and they're good, then you, you form an opinion and you sort of begin to trust a journal. And, and you trust your colleagues to talk about a journal or a conference, okay? So this is something you learn and there's sort of the skull button, word of mouth on this. There's impact factors, etc. But the scuttlebutt reputation matters the most. In my field, I can name for you the top journal. Boom. And everybody knows it. Nobody's going to dispute it. Okay? So in humanitarian engineering, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, now, the other thing is, is there's, you should have a breadth and depth strategy. Um, if you're just lo looking at one source, that's not good. If you're looking only at journals, journals uh, tend to take longer to get things in print because they do a more careful review process. So it could take, you know, a year, year and a half before it's in print. And it might have taken them six months to nine months to write up their work. You could end up with work appearing in a journal. Even if you see it, the day the journal comes out, it could be two years old. And the, the progress, I mean, there could be much more progress since then. Conferences there's, are much near term, usually within a year. The work is usually a year old. Okay, but when you go talk to the person at the conference, then you're getting the up to date. They might, I can tell you, you know, typically authors will, will say at a conference, they'll say, you know, things have changed. I mean, we've improved this or whatever. Okay, that happens. Um, online, the problem with online, of course, is, you know, I do the Google search. A microsecond later, I do the Google search, and it comes out different. Why? Because different inter internet's dynamic, right? It's not just information explosion where it's static and it's sitting there, it's dynamic, it's continually changing. You, you know, somebody, I'll say something to someone, you know, oh, I looked at their website and it stunk. Somebody says, what? It looked great to me. And you pop back up, whoa, yesterday they updated their stinking website and now it's looking great. So this stuff's happening all the time. It's, it's very hard to keep up, of course, um, with the internet, okay? So what you're trying to do is you try to pass broadly across um, all these, and yet, for your specific subjects, you would, you would go um, deep and keep in mind everything's dynamic, okay? This is a strategy you would use with any professional area in engineering, not just humanitarian engineering, okay? Next, there's the problem of groupthink. Um, groupthink's a well-known problem originally identified and studied by Janus. Uh, so you might have small human groups, let's say 10 people, uh, even big human groups, um, or socio-electronic groups, if you will, 
what happens in these kind of groups is there, what happens is people start saying, this is what I think, and somebody says, yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. There's just like this piling on of fact to the extent where everybody's sort of agreeing with everybody and nobody's saying, oh, wait a minute, this isn't quite right. You know, the lone dissenter, who then is stepped on by the engineers because engineers are like that, okay? So, so there is a problem with groupthink. Um, groupthink happens in, in very... Um, <laughs> Crucial situations in the world, like uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this is the classic example. The more recent example is with uh, Colin Powell and the, the Iraq decision. Well, this was this has been shown to be groupthink, okay, and, and led to very bad decision making. Um, there's also a lack of respect for history. Um, it's pretty depressing to see in some people's claims in humanitarian engineering, like I was first, which is complete malarkey. I'm not going to name the people, but. It's, it's pretty absurd, actually. I mean, you can go back and, uh, and, and look at, I, thought, I came across this paper, a 1996 paper by this woman, Laura uh, Parsons. Uh, uh, just a fantastic paper. I'm serious. Just, she had incredible insight. Insights that in, in statements in this paper where people would later publish papers, not referencing her because they didn't know about her work, and claiming they had the first time they've ever anybody's ever pointed this out, and you know it's completely unfair. I don't know what this woman's doing today, but uh, she really had some really fantastic insight. The far before that, you know, there's been humanitarian engineering is as old as engineering. I mean, I'm sure. I just can't prove that easily. Uh, in electrical engineering, Professor Herman Weed was doing uh, humanitarian engineering for many years on a, a project called Pro, uh, called Project Hope. So after the Second World War, they, the, the U.S. gave um, this battleship called Hope um, to this um, charitable organization, and they made it into a floating hospital. And they would go around the world and do operations in ports. And Herman Wheat supported, he was clinical engineering, he's from ECE, and he did BME. He's the guy who helped start the BME program at OSU. And uh, he, he does this, he, he was supporting their clinical engineering for this battleship. And, and in 1979, his graduate student was, some of you people know him, Roger Zwanza. And he pulled Roger in. Hey, Roger, you want to go next week to China with me? Roger's like, sure, what are we doing? <laughs> and he went. And Ro I mean, he's extremely active. Huh? Roger Zwanza now has a program in Honduras, Haiti, and Ghana. Okay? So he's been doing this all these years. So why do we care about something like that? Because we care about the history. I mean, people... It matters what was done in the past. We learn from the past, right? There's mistakes made, fix them. It's important to respect the past. And Roger, for instance, is, is an incredible experience around the world. Just ask him sometime where he's been in the world. So the OSU history, uh, there's, there's quite a bit more than that. There's a number of professors. Professor uh, um, Costin in ECE, work in Honduras. Professor Dave, um, Davidson um, in, in ISE worked with uh, Professor Costin, um, Denny, Professor Denny Gunther, Gunther in ME, retired a few years ago, but he d had worked in the area for years. Okay, so it's, uh, there's, there's really a lot that has happened in the past. Some of it's lost because there aren't reports, there aren't electronic reports in particular. It's kind of unfortunate. Um, so, let's start looking at some current information. If you say to someone in humanitarian engineering, where do you go for info? Probably the first place people would say is E4C, Engineering, engineering for Change. Whoops. Hmm. All right, that link doesn't work. We can deal with that. E4C. All right, this is the E4C website. Um, I just want to spend a little time looking around here um, and uh, talk about the design. Um, so you can register, sign up, and get on their Twitter feed and etc. Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, areas of interest. Well, look at look at what they're saying: water, energy, health, structures, agriculture, sanitation, information systems. Not surprising, right? Standard humanitarian technology areas, okay, and then their so-called resources, okay, um, so you can join for free here, and uh, down here, 
Uh, news, um, news things. A solutions library, the members of E4C workspace, um, and webinars. Okay, so let's talk about a few of these. Um, so the the solutions um, solutions library um, is here, and you can look at under. You can pick um, underwater. That's the tab that's currently hit. Okay, and then uh, we'll have um, project, um, and you can learn more about it. You see what they're doing? So it's a whole um, range of projects by different organizations. Okay, um, that could be um, put here, and then you can go to things like let's say you go to energy. Well, then you've got energy generators, clay stoves, turbine blades, etc. Okay, so um, that's um, under the solutions library. Let's go back um, now and go to the workspace. Um, so um, the workspace. Uh, Alex, I told Alex about this recently. He went and studied it. Don't shake your head, come on. Uh, it did. It's just not, not much not here. Great. It's not great. Tell them the concept, Alex. Uh, so I think the idea here is that, you know, somebody can either post what they need or what they have, um, like in terms of a solution um, or whatever. Uh, and then somebody else can go back and say, hey, what about this? Can, sort of contribute, um, get a bunch of different people working on this. And as you can see, it's just, like, this one was posted on in March, go down a little bit. February. Not a whole lot of activity, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, this, it's not clear why there's not a lot of activity, but um, uh, it is what it is, you know, the, um, in the workspace, um, and it, you can filter, this is all, I filtered by all, not just sub-projects. So this, this site grew out of something called the IEEE Humanitarian Technology Challenge, um, which was operating back in the old five, five, six, seven time frame. I was involved in that. It was funded by the United Nations uh, Vodafone um, and the IEEE Foundation. Uh, they had a site like this up and going. I was involved in the site. It was the idea was you get humanitarians on the ground like NGOs, uh, explain problems. Engineers from all over the world jump on and try to solve the problems. It was a workspace. Okay. It morphed into this apparently. Um, back then, that project HTC, as it was called, um, it, in a sense failed because it lost UN funding. But it morphed into this. They pulled in ASME, ASCE. I think now Society of Women Engineers has gotten involved recently, EWB. So it's kind of morphed into this. The conference stayed intact that they started. That's the IEEE Global Humanitarian Technology Conference. So that's the workspace. There's a bulletin board here where you can, you know what a bulletin board is. There's a job need urgently, project advice, whatever. Um, um, back to resources. Um, we did the solutions libraries, news, obviously, with us. Learning lab. So this is uh, pretty short here. Um, it just says, you know, here's some information. Um, but frequently asked questions, how to use E4C. And then you can go under what's uh, called education. Okay. And guess what? Who's number one listed academic program? The Buckeyes. Um, I thought it's, I think it's rather unusual though because somehow somebody doesn't know how to alphabetize. Everything else is alphabetized, <laughs> <laughs> but they put us number one. I have no idea why. Um, so there's a range of programs here um, that you can study not just in the U.S. but around the world. So that's kind of nice. Um, uh, the webinars. Um, when you get on the Twitter feed, you, you, you'll be alerted to when these webinars are going on. And uh, 
you could uh, join in. Um, they're just on humanitarian engineering topics from around the world, people talking about projects. Some may interest you, um, you know, you could go for it. Um, so let's go back to here. Um, and then, you know, of course, under these areas of interest, you can go in any one of these and, and study it. Um, on the, the Twitter feed, I'm taking the Twitter feed off their thing and putting it at the Humanitarian Engineering Center website. And the reason is, is sometimes job requests for, you know, jobs um, come up or not, well, what's going Posting for jobs, you know, from an NGO or something, posts say, hey, we need an engineer to do this, whatever. Sometimes they come up. Um, so that could be useful um, too, okay? So E4C, okay. Next, the, the, the other thing that came out that was related to some of the other past IEEE activities, um, I don't know, my links aren't working today. Um, Hmm, just say, what's it called? Humanitarian technology. This is sort of an interesting site. Um, so, site, you can sign up here and get on their, their news list. Um, and uh, they're, they're basically IEEE version of promoting uh, humanitarian technologies. Um, their objectives, prerequisite, they have seed grants. They put out a call just two days ago for seed grants for funding projects. Um, a steering committee, resources, and information. There are, are site, what, what they call site, whatever, sites or people um, all over the world. They have a pretty big network. Um, so look at this current active sites. Okay, so see the list? It's pretty. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty sizable, 57 of them. Um, and uh, a lot of them are in developing world um, too. So if you're doing a project um, with a country, you can look for the site location. These are people that are interested in doing this kind of stuff and work with them. Um, so site's another um, thing I think of interest. Um, and then, uh, then the next place I want to look is, um, since Sarah's here, Architecture for Humanity. So this is a design like you give a damn. Okay, so th this site's um, pretty interesting. Um, this has been around for quite a while. And... Uh, um, uh oh, they're going bankrupt. That's a brand new statement from Jan. I haven't hadn't seen that. Oh jeez, um, I don't know what's going to happen as a result of that. Um, but just a second, they do architecture projects all over the world, um, and they've often had uh, a collaborative design space that's better than EO4C one. I think they. They post all their complete designs for buildings or whatever of any sort, and uh, for what context they're used in, and then people can download the designs and use them and so forth. Um, so uh, that's one possibility. I'm gonna have to monitor that one though because the, it's not clear um, that they're gonna survive. Um, okay, so next one: appropriate technology source book. Now this one, um, Village Earth. This is probably the best source for humanitarian tech or for appropriate technology. Um, and it's all here online. Um, there's, a old, there's a book by Hazeltine and Bull that used to be the standard source, um, but it's paper only apparently. Uh, I have a copy in my office if you ever want to borrow it, but uh, this thing um, is, this site's pretty extensive. 
Um, so if you just just take a look, the, the, see, do you see the, um, this is the list of possibilities on the right there. I know it's a little small to read, but just scan down at once. And each one of you, on your projects, there's something here um, for you in some way, at least, like science teaching for the, the STEM, non-formal education training for the STEM education. Um, so, I think we should at least look at um, a link or two here. Uh, well, well, I could pick some, but um, would you like to pick one? Which of those links? There's a lot. I mean, it's almost like everything you can think of. Okay. So, what if we? Um, how about if we just go to water supply and sanitation? Okay. So, uh, all right. So, get, watch what this thing does. It's pretty incredible. These are the books that they review. I mean, books. Those are a list of books. Okay? And then look at this information. On and on and on. It's unbelievable. They review all those books. Somebody sat down, read each book, and reviewed it. This, is, this can be really useful, right? Because you can search that. Somebody was smart enough to put it all on one long list so you can search it. Right? So you got your topic. Let's say it's this. You search it. And you're like, there's this book, this book, and this book. Well, they think this book stinks, and this book's good, and this is the best book. That's useful. That's really, really useful. So I, I think this site, in my mind, is, is sort of crucial. Um, like, look at that one. Appropriate technology for water supply and sanitation from the World Bank. Okay, volume one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, it's like, there's so much information, it's, it's absurd in some ways. But this is, this is all really, really good information. Okay, what other subject you want to look at briefly? Um, the, 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 the STEM, I'm doing water and STEM because of what you people are doing, so Science teaching, so there's a general statement up front here, and then there's books, okay, um, and then the reviews of the books. Um, so last year I had a, a guy that was sort of, in, in this class was sort of funny, and I said, let people pick, and he, he chose uh, that one. That's what I was you were thinking <laughs> that. you got a great attitude. So, so I love the bees, okay? Go to my website. I've been doing research on bees for 12 years with Tom Seeley, who's the top expert in the world on the hive. And uh, so Tom actually is helping with development work via the bees. It's like, what? <laughs> well, how could you do that? It's agriculture. They make honey. We steal their honey. Remember the movie, The Bee Movie? <laughs> that was a whacked out movie. But Tom Seeley's name's at the end because they consulted him on it. But um, it's agricultural pro project, right? And, and going to teach people how to, how to um, raise bees, tend to bees, be, do a bee, be a beekeeper, has really valuable in the development context. People can sell honey, they can eat it, they can use it. It's very nutritious, it lasts almost forever. I mean, honey's an incredible thing, actually. Um, so some of the, I like bringing it up simply because the, the um, it, there's things that people do that you wouldn't expect could be humanitarian or help with development. And there are possibilities. I mean, you can do something really real. Now, Tom Seeley does education for their program. That's his role at, in there. It's called something like um, Bees for Development, okay, is what he's, the organization he's involved with. And they work in, a, he, working in Africa. Okay, so there is a huge range of possibilities here. I think this is uh, just a fantastic site. Uh, this would be on one of my t 
It's certainly on my top 10 list for humanitarian engineering to look at. Okay. Any other sites you want to look at or should we go on? Okay, so let's go. Um, there's also this, um, <laughs> that link worked. No, it didn't. <laughs> There's that conference. Just a minute, I'm not seeing. Hmm. I'm really surprised. I'm not seeing it. I, I it might have been it might have gone down, so let's not wait. Let's go do the next one, which is um um Apropedia. Appropriate Technology Encyclopedia. Okay, so this is a decent site too. Um, it, it, uh, so the idea here is, is it's a Wikipedia for appropriate technology. Okay, and um, there is, of course, a lot of information here. Um, you see the areas down. Um, the left hand side, um, right over here, the action energy, blah, 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 tons of things. I tried to assess if there's more information at one than in the other. It's pretty hard. This is really quite a good site. Um, and uh, of course, you, you can, uh, this can be updated and, and, and so forth. Um, so I would also consider the site if you're trying to find um, a relevant. Um, humanitarian uh, technology. Um, so, you know, my sense is there's some things that this site doesn't have that the, um, the other site we just went to did, and that was like those reviews of those books. It seems very useful. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, that's a, a good one to consider. Um, and then this one, let's see if it comes up. I think it's gonna come up. This is, this is nice. Um, this is more recent, but um, the Institute for Globally Transformative Technologies at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Um, and uh, here, um, they did this 50 breakthrough study um, you can download this thing. These are the 50 most critical scientific and technological breakthroughs required for sustainable global development. So they're saying these are the technologies we need. Okay. Um, if you want to start working on something, um, you can uh, you can go um, and download the report for free. I think there's actually um, not 50, but like 52 or three. That sounds good. It's better to say 50. Um, and it's fascinating array of technologies. They say these, their claim is, is that if we can solve these technological problems, we're gonna have a major impact on development, okay? Um, so they're not just talking about any technological problems, okay? So they, I think this is a really quite a useful break, uh, um, report. Um, for me, it's also useful because it frames the problem. So if I'm like trying to solve some water problem and I'm, I'm not seeing anything in appropriate technology websites, I'm not seeing anything, I go here and I say, oh, no kidding, there is nothing. They're saying there's nothing and we need it. Okay, so it's, it's nice to know what sort of isn't possible. That's sort of what some of this is saying, okay? Or you're gonna have to jump on board and do your uh, dissertation on it to solve the problem. Okay, um, next. Let's go, move to the education part, um, the so-called Global STEM Alliance. Um, this is with the New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, this is relatively new. Um, it's sort of an interesting um, approach. Uh, what they're, they're trying to do is not just do a STEM program for the US, but global, 
I mean, like the name implies, worldwide. Um, I, I mean, I've joined up and stuff, but I think that there's, I have a few concerns about this approach. What their approach is, is this. They're right now in the process of constructing a software platform for STEM that will reach out to the world. Okay, STEM education. So they'll have all this available educational materials, etc., that teachers from all over the world, maybe students too, can log in and use. All right, so that's, that sounds like a nice idea in a lot of ways, but in other ways, um, you know, I'm sort of looking at it and say, what about the hands-on part? And you know, that's so crucial in learning science and engineering, the lab, and the physical hands-on part. So maybe they could do that, though. I, I don't question their competence on this point. This is a reasonable place to start, um, but maybe they could expand out and start selling kits for experiments or something too um, to enhance it. But this is this is a pretty major effort. I think it's a good one. Um, now, <clears throat> there's all kinds of international STEM groups. Um, this one is International STEM Education Association. Um, they do, you can see right here, uh, they have a, a, um, a conference, okay? So you can go to the STEM conference and, uh, and, and uh, present papers, learn about you know, STEM, -ish, STEM education issues from others um, around the world. Um, usually, uh, I guess I don't see, um, where's the Branson Convention Center? I don't know where this is at. Well, anyway, usually the people who run these are professors and they all just want to take a vacation, so they're in nice places around the world um, where you want to do a vacation. Seriously. Um, other thing, if you want to learn about STEM education in the United States, I think probably the best source is, is uh, National Academy of Engineering. Um, they have incredible information. All these free reports, if you, if you get it electronically, um, you know, in, in a huge range of STEM topics. There's like too much here to read, okay? I've read some reports, and they're, they're generally very good reports. They're authoritative. It's really nice material. It is uh, largely, though, in bulk, uh, focuses on the U.S. Okay? It's not an international focus, but there's still things that can be learned um, um, from it. Now, we had the, uh, the global humanitarian, engine, humanitarian technology conference. Um, right there okay so this is the conference I review for uh, so in 15, 2015 in October it's in Seattle um, and here's the announcement okay um, nothing there's gonna be nothing surprising in their conference mission is basically what this class is about okay um, this is probably the top conference in the world. Yeah, it is. It's the top conference in the world on humanitarian technology. And uh, um, as you will see here, um, this, this is an IEEE conference, but let's see where their co-sponsors are. Uh, because this is, this is a, I don't see it right now. Patronage packages brochure. Anyway, it, with the E4, this is connected to E4C, and E4C has, like I said, ASCE, ASME, EWB, um, and I believe SWE um, involved. So the way these, I don't know if you've ever been to an engineering conference, but the way these typically go is um, uh, they're usually a couple of days. So this is 8, 9, 10, 11, but usually the first day would be. Um, like workshops, like learning sessions. Uh, and then there's multiple parallel sessions. So a session would be like this room and somebody giving a talk and then people give a sequence of talks. And then there's multiple rooms with parallel talks going on and you pick which one you wanna go to. Sometimes there's overlap, two talks you wanna go, but too bad, you just get it, you pick one. And then uh, 
you, uh, but in a lot of ways, the most valuable part of the conference is talking to people over coffee and, you know, out in the hallways. You, you meet an author, you talk to them, they have a similar project to yours. That, that, those discussions are what are really, really useful. And the sort of uh, in-person um, question, answer, so forth. Um, and that's happening in a lot of these conferences. So it's, it's very useful to go to these conferences. It'd be great for students to go to these conferences. The only issue is money, right? Because, you know, it's, it's an expensive trip. By the time you add up the hotel and a fly, flight, uh, it's an expensive trip. But uh, we'd like to get to a point where we're sending students to, the, to these things. Um, okay, um, the other conference that looks pretty good, I've reviewed for this, but it's, um, it's HumePAC 2015. Um, you can read it there. I, I don't know, this is another conference. It's up in, uh, typically held up in the Boston area, um, sometimes associated with, uh, associated with MIT, and uh, um, I, I've heard it's good, it's really a good get together. Um, I don't know how to compare it to the, the other little humanitarian technology conference. I haven't been to this. So that, um, it's, it's another option. Um, I, uh, I think that both are good options. Um, myself, I'm more interested in going to the, the IEEE one, but I'm an electrical engineer, so. But the IEEE one is quite broad, too. I wouldn't think of it as just like electrical engineering. You'll, you'll see, look, you, you usually, they publish our conference program which um, will say, well, this is what's happening. These are the talk, titles of the talks, who's giving the presentations, whole schedule. And then you can decide whether you wanna go or not. So this one is in the 12th to 14th of May in 2015, so it's coming up. So let's take a peek. So here's the um, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. These are the plenary talks. These are the, you know, where everybody would go to it. Um, Starbucks Partner Development with Google. John Clark, Miguel Rainier, uh, Invested Development, Nimaji, Digital Global, from the Gates Foundation, Senior Program Officer, Qatar Computing Research, um, Harvard Public Health, lots of them. G Global Research, okay, so Best attended talk here will be by this guy right here, Jake Kendall. You know why? Because he's with Gates Foundation and they're trying to give out money. You think I'm kidding? Yeah, but trust me, it probably will be. Uh, special sessions and panels. So let's give you an idea here. Impact investing in humanitarian technology. So social business stuff. Civilian military coordination during humanitarian disasters. Infotech for humanitarian operations. Government response to Ebola. There's a different character to this conference. This is typical for this conference. Whereas the IEEE one is more like appropriate technology stuff. Okay, it's, it's not entirely, but, but somewhat. Okay, um, and then there's this uh, global STEMX education conference. Um, I thought this looked interesting. Um, the, uh, well, it's pretty easy to, you know, this is on STEM education. So you're, you're trying to uh, um, learn how to better teach um, the STEM ed education subjects, and it's another conference, you know? Um, there's, uh, it, it's always amazing how many people are involved in doing this stuff. I mean, look at this, it's like, wow. There's a lot going on in each of these subject areas. These, these conferences can be a fantastic learning experience. Okay, besides sitting and listening to talks, make your choice, and talking to the people. It, it's really, you're learning the latest and greatest of the viewpoints. Okay, now, journals. Uh, I'm not gonna go to the IEEE. IEEE Technology and Society Magazine has been around for a long time. Uh, I was a guest editor for uh, a special issue on volunteerism and humanitarian engineering back in 09, and um, there's a whole series of people we had give um, papers and, and there. There's typically humanitarian engineering papers showing up in this journal regularly. This is probably the 
it's hard to say, but probably the number one journal, the second one here, International Journal for Service Learning and Engineering, Humanitarian Engineering, and Social Entrepreneurship, like the longest journal name I've ever heard. Um, let's see, the names of various things over time in this, in this area have changed, and he, they just kept adding the word, the new words on. Because this used to always be called Service Learning and Engineering. Okay, and then it, that went away, and then all these other things came up. Um, so, the Tom College over at Penn State uh, is the editor for this. Um, our group here at Ohio State had an article in just a couple months ago in this. Uh, the Journal of Humanitarian Engineering is out of uh, Australia, and then there's a journal, International Journal for STEM Education. There's places to go in terms of where to look and where to submit papers, um, which I think is generally um, quite important for students to be doing too. Um, you might have to work with faculty, but it's, it's important to be doing that. Okay, um, there's a lot more going on. So let's talk about organizations um, around the world. So Engineers Without Borders did not start in the US. Um, it started in France. It, it grew out of the in, uh, Doctors Without Borders in, in France. Uh, I'm not gonna try it in French. Um, and then there's sort of groups around the world. I, Engineers Without Borders USA is what the, the US group is called. Okay. Um, Engineers for Sustainable World um, is, a, is a nationwide, worldwide organization. And then there's a bunch of others like Engineers Against Poverty, Engineering World Health. This is a popular one. We've got a guy from this one come give a talk here. Um, practical action, tech change. Scientists Without Borders. Everybody doesn't have borders. Um, SciDevNet, like it sounds, Science for Development Network. This Institute for Innovation and Health at UCLA is nice. Then you go more locally at OSU. Um, the first uh, humanitarian um, student organization at OSU was ECOS, Engineers for Community Service, uh, which uh, um, I proposed as an idea in, in my engineering ethics class in fall of three. The students just took it and ran with it by 04. Um, we had an organization, spring break 05, first trip to Montana de Luz um, in Honduras. EWB came along uh, about five years later, um, as did SEO and uh, ESW. So um, we did not, we evaluated all these national organizations at the time and decided against going with them for, for ECOS because um, EWB had a heavy civil engineering focus and we wanted a College of Engineering reach out. Group. So same thing held for some of these other organizations. So that's why that's why ECOS was sort of homegrown. It was a, a conscious choice um, by the students, especially since initially they were all electrical engineering students. Yes. What about the Humanitarian Engineering Scholars Group? That's not a student organization. It's, what's the difference? Um, Humanitarian Engineering Scholars is a living learning community. It's not a student organization. I mean, it's not. At OSU, those are really different things. It's a scholars program rather than a, yeah. We're going to come to that when we talk about the center. Uh, so the ESW, the two in the architecture are Servitecture and Design Build Institute of America at OSU. Um, and then there's the Ecological uh, Engineering Society of OSU over at um, uh, Food Ag and Biological Engineering. Um, if you want more information, you look at the Humanitarian Engineering Center. We'll talk about that center on um, the last day and talk about things like Humanitarian Engineering Scholars and many other aspects of um, the, uh, the center and what the overall program is at Ohio State, what trips are going on. Um, we have an awful, awful lot of activity going on. Um, so we'll, we'll be covering that um, on the last day of class. Okay, um, any 